Hello, everybody. Welcome into Perspectives. I'm Sam Jones. It's good to have you with us today. And boy, if we got something right off the top, I think you're going to enjoy. Grab a notepad because you're going to want to buy something that I'm holding. It's a book by Vivian Howard. And you're going to want a copy of this for yourself, I promise you. Available at your local bookstores. Mm -hmm. Easy to come by. Um, Vivian, welcome. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm so fascinated with your book. I, you've become quite a celebrity in the TV circles. How, how did this all come about? Um, well, I, uh, I grew up in rural eastern North Carolina on a tobacco farm. Always wanted to leave rural eastern North Carolina and um, eventually moved to New York um, to be a journalist. I had an internship at CBS Sunday Morning in college, and then I thought I could translate that into a career in media, but I started working in restaurants because uh, I'd always worked in restaurants um, as a, a college student. Mm -hmm. And still with that like dream of storytelling, I started working in the kitchen of restaurants as a means to turn that into a career in food writing. And then I just kept cooking um, and found that I really enjoyed that. I loved making things with my hands and I saw parallels between cooking and writing, and my um, then boyfriend and I moved back to Eastern North Carolina and opened a restaurant that was uh, called Chef and the Farmer, and had been open for about five years, and I still had this deep desire to tell stories, so I reached out to a childhood friend of mine <coughs> to see if she would help me make a documentary about the dying food traditions of our region, and that's how it all kind of started. Um, and the interesting thing about it is there are traditional styles that are dying out. Oh, 100%. I mean, I grew up watching my grandmother do things like put up corn or canned tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And I heard my sisters who are older talk about hog killings and pickled pork and, you know, all these things that I, I didn't have the same type of exposure to. And so I wanted to kind of... Um, put those things in a capsule so that my children, our grandchildren would, would know um, what it once took to get food on the table. Which at, at one time was a blistering load of work. Yeah, so it took the whole family. How many restaurants do you own? Um, so I have three restaurants right now, uh, Chef and the Farmer in Kinston, North Carolina, uh, Lenore in Charleston, South Carolina, and Handy and Hot also in Charleston. You, but when I, I love to hear you talk because there's just a hint of the softness of the southern accent. Yes. It's, it's, it's there. It's not that lazy sound. It's that beautiful sound that comes from, from living there, being from there, yes, that you and bring with you. That's what a lot of people, that's how I get recognized often, is people will hear me talking and they're like, oh, it's that lady's voice. Um, so <laughs> I've never found it particularly uh, beautiful, but some people have. Well, don't listen to yourself. <laughs> don't listen to yourself. I've heard so many guys and gals on TV who say, veterans, mind you, who say, I hate the sound of my own voice, which I can understand. I love mine. Having said that, <laughs> <laughs> does your husband work with you? Well, um, we are actually no longer married. So you're a free agent. I'm a free agent, yes. Make a note. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, how'd you come up with the idea for Somewhere South? So, you know, we had been making A Chef's Life for six seasons, and, you know, my life and work was really the subject of A Chef's Life, and I became really tired of um, my own narrative. And I really wanted to, the opportunity to turn the lens outward and show um, show how nuanced and how ever-evolving southern food is and how where the food that we eat is really shaped by the people in our community and that's always changing mm -hmm. um, so somewhere south uh, is a show that is about a dish that every culture shares so we had a um, greens episode because every culture has their way of cooking greens we had a porridge episode um, every culture has a you know a bowl of grits or a bowl of oatmeal or foo-foo, you know, every culture has a porridge. We did a barbecue episode. Um, so it was a means to show how, you know, no matter where you come from, um, we all eat the same foods and pretty much for the same reasons. 
You know, it's, it's intriguing when you really give it some serious thought, which occasionally I do have serious thoughts, but it, when you give it serious thought, when you recognize that every family had its own specialty yes. in the kitchen. My grandmother on my mother's side made a dish called, called wilted lettuce, which involved the drippings from bacon yes. over lettuce and white radishes and green onions and, I mean, put together, you, when you talk about it, it sounds like, ooh, 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 you know, but let me tell you something, it'll knock your head off. We it, call that killed lettuce. Really? Yes, and the, all the ingredients that you listed, um, you know, like fresh spring lettuces, those would often, you know, could have been wild originally. So dandelion greens, anything like that. The scallions, the green onions, also likely originally wild. Radishes are one of the first things to pop up in the spring garden. Um, and then, you know, using the renderings from cooking bacon is just such a, uh, a thrifty kind of southern thing to do uh, because you're not going to waste that tasty fat. And then you've got an mm -hmm. amazing salad. Let me hit you with an unfair question because we haven't had a chance to discuss this, but in your travels, have you any idea, have you kicked over a rock and found a clue as to when humans started trying to preserve food and save it for down the road? For as long as we have recorded history. Really? I mean, you know, salting meat, salting fish was, you know, probably the first means of that. Fermenting vegetables, you know, every long-standing culture on the planet has a very deep um, ferment fermented culture. You know, think of kimchi, um, and all of this was a means to preserve mm -hmm, food mm -hmm. uh, because we had no way to keep things fresh forever. You know, our tradition of country ham. Um, so stop it. Yeah, is 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 all for <laughs> that. You know, it's a lot of these practices of preserving foods were something that were like developed out of necessity, but they became something that we really appreciate the deliciousness of. You're in Tulsa primarily because we have a fundraising dinner tonight. Yes. You are there as our guest. We're thrilled to death to have you. Uh, what are you going to bring to the table tonight? What will you offer the folks who are going to be there? Well, you know, I've been here for a couple days now, and I see a lot of synergies and parallels between Tulsa and Oklahoma and where I come from. Um, I know y'all don't like to be called Midwestern, but it, I think you're kind of the gateway to the Midwest. Mm -hmm, In some ways, mm -hmm. you're between the South and the Midwest and Texas. And um, so I hope to bring a little Eastern North Carolina uh, to you. <laughs> And I hope that, um, you know, we're going to have some interesting ingredients to talk about tonight. And, you know, I love, I love history and the way that food ties to our history. And so I hope I'm going to be able to share some of my own. Vivian, thank you. We're out of time. Thank I you. do appreciate it very much. Again, this is a book. Grab a copy. It's worth your time to add it to your kitchen. Show it to your friends. Read it, for goodness sake. There's a lot in here. We'll see you down the road, kid. Thank you. Short break. We'll be right back.